years ago. It was exactly on this day, uh, the 21st of July 1969, that Apollo 11, the American super heavy lift launch vehicle, launched the Saturn V launch vehicle, launched Apollo 11 and put man on the moon for the first time ever in the history of mankind. Today, on the anniversary day of this, one of the most remarkable achievements of humankind, let us have a closer look of the moon, the only celestial body other than our own planet Earth, where humans have marked their presence, where humans have set their foot on. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ashwadiya Krishnan and I welcome you all to this Moonlight Talk. In the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, I will be taking you through the story of the moon, how the moon has originated, how it has evolved, our scientific quest, discoveries that we have made in the moon and our future aspirations. So once again, welcome you all to this talk. So moon, as we all know, it has always fascinated human beings. We always look skyward for inspiration and sometimes for navigation because we trace the path of sun and the moon earlier in the ancient times for determining our paths, for timekeeping because of the regularity of the lunar cycles. So always we had a connection with the sky and the celestial bodies. But moon was special because it's the brightest object in our night sky. It used to illuminate our, light, illuminate our nights. And so, and I think uh, most of the romantic poetry it is replete with references of the moon. The moon is uh, described with a character of its own. Sometimes it's described as a coming ball of silver, coming ball of silver, and sometimes as a companionless observer in the night sky. Now, I think uh, for most of the Malayalis out here, one of the first pieces of poetry that we are all acquainted with, right from our childhood, is Ambili Ammava Tahamare Kumbili Lendunda. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the North Indians may not be knowing here, but uh, for us, for Malayalis, Chandran, that is the Ambili Ammavan, is our own uncle. So we have that kind of a special connection with the moon. But anyways, before I venture to describe more about the moon, and some of the matters, some of the things that you already know, let us see why we are celebrating this International Moon Day. As I said, it is to commemorate the landing of the Apollo 11 spacecraft on the moon. That happened on July 20, 1969. But Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong descended onto the moon and he stepped foot on the moon on July 21st, 1969. So that's the speciality of this day. So they went by the uh, Saturn V launch vehicle and the Saturn V launch vehicle had three modules, the command module, the lunar module and the service module. The lunar module landed on the moon and from that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon. So we will come in, to, in detail about that later, but this is the event that we are commemorating today. As I said, moon has a special place in human civilization. So some of the poems have been written on moon and uh, it has been affecting, it has been believed to affect human behavior also in many religions, cultures and all. It is the basis of astrology in some cultures. And uh, Beowulf, I think uh, Harry Potter f uh, fans among you, you might be knowing, Beowulf is a human who is believed to have the ability to transform into a Beowulf on a, transform into a wolf on a full moon night. So these kind of references are there in the folklore about the moon. But moon, when we grew up, we came to know that it is only a natural satellite of the earth. Like more than 200 moons, similar such moons that exist in the solar system, it is only one among those. But if you see the size of the moon, it is very big, it's quite massive. Out of these 200 moons, it is the fifth the largest moon in the solar system. The biggest moon is Ganymede, it is the moon of Jupiter. But after Ganymede, Titan, Callisto and Io, our moon is the largest. And our moon is quite dense also, the second densest moon after Io. Here there is one interesting fact that if you see the mass of the planet with respect to that of the moon, 
the moon is quite heavy it's about 1 by 80th it's having the mass about 1 by 80th of that of earth whereas if you compare other satellites like for ganymede the ratio is very big it's about 4000 jupiter is 4000 times heavier than ganymede the implication of this is that the moon has have moon has got a very significant impact on earth unlike the other satellites we'll see about this later and moon in mythology i must say this because in hindu mythology and indian mythology generally the moon is considered as a god he is a god who governs night the growth of plants and vegetation and uh, he is one of the navagrahas also we call him the chandra deva he is the mythological personification of moon in indian context but not only in india if you see other cultures and religions also there is a divine embodiment of moon everywhere some personification is there for example the greek goddess selene the roman goddess luna some of these names were taken to name the lunar missions luna missions of soviet union is named after the roman goddess luna so almost every ancient civilization personified moon in their mythologies now when we see moon from earth we only see the near side of the moon i think most of you might be remembering some uh, high school physics that we have learned why we have why we see only the same face of the moon all the time i'll just touch upon that but just we have to see that we see only one side of the moon from the earth and we call it the near side of the moon the other side which is not visible to us from earth it is called the far side of the moon some of the moon phenomena that have interested human beings ever since antiquity because we always see the phases of the moon the moon is not a constant in our night sky sometimes we see a full moon sometimes we don't see a moon at all so that's a new moon we call that night a new moon night so these are called the phases of the moon then eclipses we hear about eclipses all the time so lunar eclipses why these eclipses happen this has been a question for our astronomers then tides this is one of the uh, one of the examples of the impact that moon has on earth i'll explain about this later then tidal locking and libration so why do we see the same phase of the moon always the answer lies in a phenomenon called tidal locking uh, all the bodies in the solar system all the bodies in the universe they exert mutual attractive forces due to gravitation so the earth pulls the moon towards it the moon pulls the earth towards it but moon being slightly lighter than the earth it experiences much higher gravitational forces and uh, the side of the moon that is closest to the earth will experience a higher force as compared to the side that is farther from earth so there is an unbalance in the force and this unbalance causes a tilt such that the major axis of that uh, elliptical body now that elliptical body why that why that bulge is coming it is coming due to this gravitational pull only so that major axis of the elliptical body will be aligned in a line joining the center of the earth to the moon so this is called tidal locking and because of this tidal locking there is something called synchronous rotation what is synchronous rotation the moon rotates about its own axis at the same rate at which it is it is rotating around the earth so that is why we see the same side of the moon always and the moon is rotating around the earth in an elliptical orbit so because of this elliptical orbit there is something called libration now why that libration is coming is we see an oscillatory motion of the moon if only we see the near side of the moon all the time we will see only about 50% of the surface of the moon that's what we expect but actually we are able to see about 59% of the surface of the moon why that is coming it is coming one reason for that is it is it is traveling through an elliptical orbit and because of that elliptical orbit sometimes when it is crossing the perigee part of it the velocity uh, with which the moon orbits at the perigee part of it and the apogee part of it is slightly different and because of that there is a lead or lag of the orbital axis of the moon with respect to the orbiting uh, plane so because of that we see libration and oscillatory motion of the moon and there is a slight tilt of the spin axis of the moon also if you see the spin axis of the moon it is inclined by about 5 degree with respect to the orbital plane of the moon around the earth so these are the some these are some of the phenomena that we have learned in school 
So these are the phases of the moon. So the sun illuminates only one half of the moon. The side which the sun illuminates when it is visible to us, it is a full moon night for earth. And when it is in the dark side, when the sunlight hits at the far side of the moon, then we see a new moon on earth. So this is the reason for the new moon and full moon. And there is one lunar cycle, one lunar cycle will be around 29.3 days. So there is a consistency in the lunar cycles. Now this consistency in the lunar cycle was what that led our ancestors to rely on the moon for timekeeping. So we have made a lunar calendars based on this consistency of the lunar cycles. So men used to plan and man used to plan their agricultural activities with respect to the lunar cycles in the past. So they could sow their seeds, harvest, all these things were done according to the lunar cycles earlier. So this is, these are the phases of the moon. Now coming to eclipses, eclipses it's relatively simple. When earth blocks the view of the moon from the sun, we see a lunar eclipse. There are two kinds of eclipses, a total lunar eclipse, a partial lunar eclipse. When the moon falls in the umbra region, that the completely shadowed region of the earth, we see a lunar, total lunar eclipse. And when it falls in the penumbra region, it is partially shadowed and we see a partial lunar eclipse. This is a video which shows that eclipse. Coming to the tides, I have already explained what, how these tides are happening on earth. The moon will be pulling the earth from both the sides. On one side where the moon is pulling, the, both the landmass as well as the water on earth, both are getting pulled. But the water since it is free to flow, there will be tidal bulges which we see as high tides on earth. Now, both the sun as well as the moon are exerting gravitational pull on earth. When the gravitational pull of the earth and uh, moon, uh, sun and moon are additive, we get what we call as spring tides. And when it is in a, a fashion in which it, uh, it slightly reduces the effect of that pull, we see what are called neap tides. Now these spring tides and neap tides are very important for uh, marine navigation and all. Because uh, during neap tides, if a ship gets anchored there, then uh, it will be difficult to, uh, difficult to start from there again. So these kind of marine navigation activities are heavily uh, relying on the, heavily uh, checking these lunar cycles all the time. And lunar cycles are also having an effect on the biological processes uh, for many organisms. So we see that uh, the reproduction patterns of many organisms are, have been found to be linked to the lunar cycles. The great coral reef in Australia, they reproduce during full moon cycles. And the predatory patterns of uh, several predatory animals that have also been seen to be linked to the lunar cycles. So that way, these are very important. Now, sidereal period of a body is the time that it takes to complete a rotation around a, a around the primary body about which it is orbiting and with respect to a fixed star. And the moon takes around 27.3 days to complete a rotation around earth. But this period is slightly lesser than the synodic period which is the time that it takes to transition from one new moon to the next. And this is because of the 5 degree inclination between the moon's orbital axis and the earth, that illumination conditions slightly vary. That is why it is taking two extra days to transition from one new moon to the next. So these are basics. Now coming to the statistics, the moon and earth, we will see why moon is significant for earth. But checking the conditions in moon, moon does not have an atmosphere at all. It has a very thin atmosphere. Coming to the magnetic field, the magnetic field is in moon is close to nil. The surface gravity is about one sixth that of earth. So the implication of this is that one, okay, a person who is weighing 100 kg on earth, he will weigh only 16 times less when he is on moon. But it will be difficult for us to settle there with such less gravity. But if you see all the conditions here, do you think that Moon will offer a habitable space any time in our near future? I'm sure the answer is going to be no, because it's quite inhospitable. With such inhospitability, 
why do we still explore the moon? So, before going to the reasons why we should explore the moon, what is the moon formed of? The moon has got a very thin crust, it's a differentiated body, just like our earth is, it has got a core, it has got a mantle and it has got a crust. The core is made of solid iron and then outside the solid iron core, there is a liquid iron uh, outer core and followed by a mantle which is kind of molten and then there is a crust. The moon has a very thin crust, the core is very small and dense, it is made of iron and nickel and uh, just it would suffice for us to know that, uh, that mantle is having very little volcanic activity, I will tell you the significance of that later. Coming to the origin of the moon, so the moon was supposed to have formed around 4.5 billion years ago. So this is very close to the time of formation of our solar system and our earth also. And there have been many theories about the formation of moon, but any theory that we propose to explain the formation of the moon should be consistent with the facts that we already know, certain geochemical observations, certain geophysical observations and the laws of celestial dynamics. So one thing is that the geochemical factors when we consider, we know that the isotopic compositions of the moon and earth are somewhat similar. Now if we compare the composition of the earth with respect to any other body in the solar system, it is dissimilar. But when we come to the moon, the moon has a similar isotopic composition, particularly oxygen and tungsten isotopes are similar with respect to what we find in earth. Then the second point is the geophysical uh, points, the geophysical uh, composition, uh, the ge geophysical uh, processes that we have to see is that one we have to explain why the moon has such a low density iron core. The earth is having a significant core which is very dense which is made up of iron but the moon's core is very small. We will have to explain this. Any theory that we propound should be able to explain this observation. And the third one is that it should be consistent with the laws of celestial dynamics, the spin rate of the earth, the angular momentum of the earth moon system. So all these things should be able, should be explained. There were three, three, three theories uh, put forward by scientists in the pre-Apollo era, mainly about the formation of the moon. In the post-Apollo era, based on the lunar samples that we have received from the Apollo missions, one giant impact theory has been proposed and this this is widely accepted by the scientists everywhere, but still the other theories are not, were not completely rejected by the scientists, so I will just tell those also. So one was the capture theory, which tells that the moon was formed somewhere else in the solar system. And then later, when it came closer to the earth, it was captured by the gravitational attraction of the earth and now it is a satellite of the earth. So this is what the capture theory says. The second theory is fission theory. Fission theory says that at the time of formation of earth, earth was spinning at a very high rate. So it had very high angular momentum and the centrifugal force from earth forced some material out of the earth itself which later developed into its moon. The third theory is co-formation theory which says that both the earth and the moon were formed at around the same time and from the same planetary nebula and from the same accretion disk. Now why these theories were rejected? Coming to the capture theory which says that the moon was formed somewhere else. This cannot be true because as I said earlier, the composition of the moon and the earth are similar when compared to any other celestial body in the universe that we know of or in the solar system that we know of. So this theory cannot be true and hence it is rejected. The second theory is fission theory which says that Earth had very high spin rate because of which matter was pushed out of earth. Now this cannot be true because we have no evidence suggesting that the earth was rotating at such high rates at the beginning of the, during the beginning of the solar system. And the co-formation theory again, co-formation theory states that both the earth and moon were formed at around the same time from the same planetary nebula. Planetary nebula means these are just clouds of gas and dust. But this also cannot be true because this cannot explain why the iron core in the moon is so less dense, so small. So coming to the giant impact theory, actually it's a good story. It says that after about, about uh, 100 uh, 
million years or so after the formation of earth a giant uh, not a giant okay mass sized object named as thea thea is actually the uh, it's the uh, it's known as a mother of moon that's why that uh, object is named as thea the thea came and collided with earth and forcing some heated material high volumes of heated material to separate from earth and this material which got separated from earth that uh, debris later coalesced to form the moon so this is the theory so this explains this can explain uh, why the composition of moon is similar to that of earth so according to this uh, this occurred around 100 million years after solar system formation so according to this theory we can explain why the composition of moon is similar to that of earth we need not find evidences uh, for the high spin rate of earth that is uh, that is propounded by the fission theory so this is the currently accepted theory of formation of moon so and this is the evolution of the moon shown in the graph shown in the picture so the moon was formed after 100 million years of formation of solar system and the impact with thea it caused heated material to go out of the earth and this became an ocean of magma this ocean of magma later solidified with time and this formed the crust of the moon but again the volcanic activity of the moon has not ceased by then it witnessed a period called the late heavy bombardment so this is a period in the solar system when lot of impacts were happening everywhere in the solar system so many objects came and crashed into the moon and uh, because the moon's insides were still molten some of the lava has creeped out and this is still found on the surface of the moon so this is uh, how the moon has evolved the magma ocean that formed as a result of the collision with thea it later solidified and this is the present moon if we observe moon from earth we can see a lot of black spots once upon a time it was believed that the moon had a smooth and shining surface but then once with the advent of telescopes and all and man started observing moon from close we started seeing black spots on the moon earlier these were believed to be lunar seas and they were named as maria or mares so it's a latin word for lunar sea actually they are not seas at all what they are is as i said when create when impacts with other heavenly bodies or other celestial bodies happened so these left big craters on the surface of the moon and the mantle which is molten from that mantle lava seep through the craters and these form some basalt like features on the surface of the moon which are iron rich and because they are iron rich they don't reflect light much and we see them as dark from the earth so these are the cause of that black spots on the surface of the moon and we call them mares actually uh, this figure it shows a lot of uh, mares the names of uh, many mares found in the moon the moon is full of highlands and mare regions we have uh, we can see mares as well as uh, slightly more illuminated highlands called the terrae on the surface of the moon now the moon was not always like this in the earth's night sky after about 1000 years of its formation it was nearly 12 times closer to the earth so that was how we could see the moon at that point in time but now the moon is receding away from earth at about 4 cm per year so from 30000 km from the earth surface now it is about what's the distance of the moon from earth it's about 384000 km so it's slowly receding still it is receding now why should we study about the moon what is the scientific motivation behind the moon exploration and studies as i said both the moon and earth were formed at about the same time around 4.5 billion years ago but earth is having an atmosphere our atmosphere protects us from a lot of things the impact of uh, asteroids or meteorites uh, uh, comets and other celestial bodies uh, and a magnetic field on the earth because of the volcanic activity on earth this also protects us from solar particles solar flux other radiation effects and all but the moon has no such protection since it does not have an atmosphere 
since it doesn't have a magnetic field, nothing is there to protect the moon from the impact of craters or radiation flux, nothing. So the outcome of this is, in one way, if we have to study about the earth or the beginnings of the solar system or any, bo any other body in the solar system, the moon is the perfect destination where we should go to study. Because the moon is a natural laboratory. It preserves the history of everything that has ever impacted it because of the lack of atmosphere and magnetic field. So the moon is a record keeper. And then if we, had, if we can study the structure and composition of the moon, since it is a differentiated body, like I said, it's, it has a core, mantle and crust. Since it's a differentiated body, if we want to study about planetary differentiation, then the moon can be uh, used to study that. Similarly, the lunar poles, there are permanently shadowed craters in the lunar poles. So, that has material which uh, came to the moon because of impacts from comets and meteoroids. So, if we study the mineralogical composition of the moon, we can get ideas about the composition of material elsewhere in the solar system. The impact processes in planetary scale. Then the regolith processes. Now, regolith is the lunar soil. The lunar soil is sticky, abrasive, it is high in silicate and it has got a lot of minerals also. If we have to study about the regolith processes, it gives us an idea how the soil evolves, how the weathering processes happen in a place where there is no air, no water to erode it. Now, so earlier we were studying about the moon from the earth through observation direct observation as well as through telescopic observation. But with the dawn of space era, we have got an opportunity to visit the moon and make studies. So the first lunar missions, it started at the time of uh, Cold War. So there was a space race between uh, the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, the Soviet Union launched the first satellite Sputnik 1 on uh, October 4, 1957. And followed by, the, after, after that mission, the Soviet Union had a string of successes and uh, they were achieving all the first. So this was uh, a blow to the American supremacy in the field of space. The first lunar mission was by Soviet Union. It was named as Luna 1 and this was launched in 1959. This was a flyby mission. It went to the moon, fly around the moon and then uh, passed the moon. And this was the first success when we discuss about lunar missions. Coming to the Luna 2 mission, again this happened in 1959. So this was the first spacecraft to impact the moon's surface. So they had to master a lot of technologies to put, a, or put an object to the moon. They had to escape from Earth's gravity pull and they had to go to another celestial body and make it impact or orbit. So these were the challenges faced by the initial lunar missions. Again, Luna 3 of uh, Soviet Union, this is a very important mission because until then we have seen only the near side of the moon. So this was the mission that gave us the first pictures of the far side of the moon. So we didn't know how the moon's far side looked, at, looked like. So Luna 3 gave us the first pictures of the moon's far side. At the same time, the U United States were also, was also launching a lot of lunar missions, the Ranger and Surveyor missions mainly. The moon mission was uh, something that the United States uh, took as a prestigious mission because uh, the moon landing was declared by uh, John F. Kennedy as was mentioned at the beginning of this talk because Soviet Union won all the other, I mean major achievements in the field of space was uh, made by Soviet Union and uh, United States want to prove its supremacy and uh, John F. Kennedy declared that they chose to go to the moon to prove this supremacy. So they wanted to make a man land on the moon and because of this, they wanted to have a survey of the lunar landing sites, the geography there, the topology there, so as to identify the conditions that are there in the moon. For this purpose, the ranger and surveyor missions were sent by the US during this period. And Zone 5, again a mission of the Soviet Union, so this mission send the first living creatures to fly past the moon. And the Apollo missions, there were 17 Apollo missions in total. 
and the Apollo 1 mission, like was mentioned, it was a failure because the cabin crew, uh, they were burnt alive actually. So after this setback, there were 16 other missions. The 13th mission, Apollo 13, they could not make a moon landing. But Apollo 11, it made the first moon landing. Apollo 8 was the mission which sent a crewed orbiter to moon. So that mission, that spacecraft orbited the moon and the landing was made by Apollo 11. And some other important missions to the moon are there like uh, Lunokhod 1. Lunokhod 1 was the first robotic rover to explore the surface of a world beyond Earth. This was a Soviet mission again and this was very important. This uh, Lunokhod missions happened in 1971 and 1973. Because you know, where man cannot reach, robots can reach. Now we don't know what dangers are lurking in other planetary bodies. So we can send robots and we can explore. So the Soviet Union that, uh, did that through the lunar code mission. And by 1990, actually after the Apollo missions, there was a break. People were not uh, going to the moon because they thought that they have got enough information about the moon. Until Japan was the first Asian country to venture into the lunar missions. And this was done in 1990. The first orbiter impact prop was sent by Japan. And then there were a lot of other missions. Currently, China is sending rovers uh, and other missions to the moon, named by the Ch uh, named as Chang E. And India's own Chandrayaan missions are also there. Since uh, the International Moon Day celebrations are conducted to commemorate this Apollo 11 moon landing, we should uh, see it in quite detail. So this was the rocket that took and to the moon, Saturn V. So this was a very heavy rocket. Uh, it had a payload capability about, uh, of about 1,40,000 kg to low Earth orbit. So you can imagine how big that rocket was. And it was realized in the 1960s. So this was a three-stage rocket. And we had the Apollo spacecraft at the top. The crew escape system after that. And this had five F1 engines in the first stage. And the person there is Werner Von Braun, the chief designer of this rocket. This was the Apollo mission flight plan. This is how man went to the moon for the first time. So this was a very complex maneuver. It was not that simple to take a man to the moon. At that time, what was done was, first, the Saturn V was launched from the Kennedy Space Center. It went to a parking orbit near the earth, from where the translunar injection was done and uh, the Apollo module, it was on a costing phase in the lunar path and finally it was captured by moon's gravity and uh, you can see that it descended from that spiraling orbit, uh, sorry circular orbit around the moon and this was the return maneuver. The lander module which landed on the moon, it got separated from the command and service module uh, in the lunar orbit. And finally, uh, after the experiments that were conducted by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon, they, uh, they left the lunar lander back in the moon itself and the lunar module came and docked with the service module that was there in the lunar orbit waiting for them. And finally, they came back. So again, a trans-Earth injection was conducted there to take the module back to the Earth orbit. So all this, all this uh, maneuvers were very complex. Actually, some docking, mid uh, maneuver docking and all was done at that point in time. Because the Apollo module that you have seen earlier, as I said, there were three modules. One was the command module. The other one was a service module, which uh, provided the propulsion systems and the oxygen tanks and all for the command module and then was the, there was a lunar module which was meant to take the man to the moon, which was supposed to land on the moon. Now, the lander module was uh, kept, uh, uh, it had to dock with the service module in the mid course. Actually, while it was making that uh, lunar costing, at that time, it had to flip 180 degree and it had to dock back to the service module before proceeding on the lunar orbit. I'll just show you a video of that. So the crew could access the lunar module, which had been so stored in a protective the compartment during launch. To do this, the command service module detached and flipped 180 degrees, lunar landing module. the lunar module and extracting it. In the process, they ditched the third, now useless, stage of the Saturn rocket. 
this whole high stakes launch this process docking was then twice and actually and this after the lunar ma Apollo module landed on the moon the when end. it was returning back to the lunar orbit at that time also docking was done and this was the historic man. moment and man landed on the moon i think that was neil's quote i didn't understand no, one small step for man but i didn't get the second phrase Apollo and this was the re-entry, and later it splashed down. The video is not that clear. Now coming to the India's foray into the lunar missions, we have first launched the Chandrayaan-1 mission in 2008. Chandrayaan-1 mission was a great success in terms of the science experiments that it performed. It was a very, you know, very uh, a glorious example of international cooperation in the field of space. But we did not have a heavy lift launcher like the Saturn V. So we, re we relied on a workhouse vehicle, PSLV. And uh, we had very innovative mission planning to take us to the moon. And Chandrayaan 2, as you all know, it was launched in 2019. And uh, we had a lander and an orbiter. The orbiter is still performing experiments and it is taking data of the surface of the moon. And uh, the Chandrayaan 3 mission is planned with the lander and rover. So some of the experiments that were devised in Chandrayaan-1, uh, they made some disruptive discoveries, such as it confirmed the presence of water on the surface of the moon for the first time. So the first picture that you can see, the blue, uh, the blue lines in that uh, figure, it shows the presence of hydroxyl radicals in the polar areas. So this is indicative of the presence of water and this was found by the moon mineralogy mapper payload in the Chandrayaan-1. Similarly, there was a moon impact prop. That was the first object of an Asian object that impacted on the lunar surface. And it had a payload called CHASE. The Chandra Altitudinal Composition Experiment was done by that. And that only actually detected the hydroxyl radicals along with the moon mineralogy mapper. Uh, this was important because uh, until then, it was uh, believed that the moon was dry as a bone and it did not have any traces of water. The lunar poles was believed to have water because uh, the craters had deposits of water ice in it. Whereas the exosphere of the moon was totally believed to be dry and this was broken by the Chandrayaan-1 experiment. Then several other experiments showed us the presence of a lot of valuable minerals on the surface of the moon such as magnesium, calcium, silicon and all and helium-3 was one mineral, uh, uh, was one, uh, one co component that is of interest to lots of people around because helium-3 can act as a waste-free source of energy and the presence of helium-3 is very high in the moon. So all these things were taken from Chandrayaan-1. Uh, water on the moon is very significant because if we have to uh, set up a habitable zone in any other planet, or any other celestial body, then we need to have water, we need to have some air, we need to have some setup where we can survive. So water is very important and these are some of the missions that have confirmed the presence of water and moon, including our Chandrayaan-1. The India's upcoming mission to moon is Chandrayaan-3, where we want to study the seismicity of the moon, the thermal composition, the elemental composition of the moon, particularly near the landing site. And when we come to popular fiction, uh, these things were imagined long back by many science fiction writers. The first picture that you can see, he is a gentleman called Wang Hu, who lived in China uh, around 16th century. The Chinese were the leaders in gunpowder and early rocketry. So that person, he wanted to go to the moon and he had an idea that if we light a rocket from earth, it can take him directly to the moon. So he made a chair with 47 rockets underneath. He asked his servants to light that and then he believed that he'll be taken directly to the moon. But then, okay, uh, after lighting that rockets, then we didn't have any information about him later. But then, that was the first concept and uh, concept that uh, by firing rockets, one could launch oneself to from outside the confines of earth and go to other celestial body. And because of this, a crater in moon has been named after him as a Van Gogh crater. And then 
the science fiction writers like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. Jules Verne, he is a French author and he wrote the book From Earth to the Moon in 1895, so which discussed how to go to the moon, what are the conditions there and the importance of this book is that it had some equations in it which describes how to get there and how to live there and all and that was quite radical revolutionary for, at that period of time. And there are so many other books, the main science fiction writers like Robert Henlein, Arthur C. Clarke uh, and H. G. Wells, they discussed about lunar colonization, how to survive in moon, the conditions uh, that the humans have to face in low gravity situations and all. So these were discussed in detail and now it's the time when we are actually implementing all this or we are actually near to the near to realizing the dreams of these people, what they have discussed in these books. The lunar missions, particularly the crewed missions, ended by Apollo missions in 1970s. But after that, no country has ventured to put a man on the moon. Now this is going to resume with the Artemis mission. The Artemis mission by NASA, it's planned in 2025 and NASA plans to put uh, the first woman and a man of color because earlier whoever has gone, they were Americans and they were white people. 24 mu humans have gone to the moon and 12 of them landed on the surface of the moon too. Now they want to take a woman first to the moon and the Artemis mission plans a lot. Like it plans to develop a lunar base camp where man can go, set up a habitat there. It's not easy to uh, develop a habitat in moon because you know the moon is not shielded from anything. It can be hit by craters, it can be hit by comets at any time, meteorites or any objects. So we need a shield if we have to stay there. So we have to develop habitats which can protect us from that kind of impacts. So some construction of habitats have been proposed in various uh, uh, conferences and all. Now this is being explored by the scientific community also. And the Artemis mission plans to set up a lunar habitat which uses the resources in the moon itself to develop those. The construction materials will come from the surface of the moon. We can tap the minerals that are already present in the moon. We can generate oxygen for breathing from the, the water that is present in the moon just through electrolysis and that's something. We can uh, generate the water and also hydrogen can be used as a fuel. And if we set up a lunar base camp, it will be easy for us to explore the remaining parts of the solar system also because from Earth, we will have to go through the atmosphere which takes quite a lot of uh, uh, power and uh, thrust also. But whereas if you launch a, a rocket from the moon, it won't take as much propellant. So this way, it is easier for us to explore the remaining parts of the solar system from the moon. So the lunar habitat is a concept that Artemis mission is putting forward. It also uh, is proposing to have a lunar orbiting gateway just like the International Space Station that we have. So where experiments can be conducted. So all these uh, proposals are currently being considered by NASA and the launch is planned in 2025. So what this science fiction writers have proposed in 1901, the book Jules Verne has written from Earth to the Moon, it was written in 1895. At that time nobody imagined that one could go to the moon before the end of the century. But now we are at a place where we can actually dream of going to the moon and setting up a habitat there and live there. We can make use of the observations made by many uh, lunar missions including the Chandrayaan one which has uh, actually one of the payloads that I must mention, the terrain mapping camera in uh, Chandrayaan 1, it has found a feature called the lava cave. The lava caves are under the, slightly under the surface of the moon. Now these can offer protection from uh, the impacts that I have said. It is a volcanic tube which was formed after billions of years of uh, volcanic activity. Magma was flowing through that uh, cylindrical shaped tube and then that uh, it is now hollow. So it, it offers some habitable space inside the moon. So this lava tube was one major discovery made by the terrain mapping camera in Chandrayaan 1. We can use that for habitation as well. So we are waiting for the next uh, set of lunar exploration missions. And as part of this International Moon Day, we just want to introduce the moon to you in a new fashion. Like we have to know why we are planning missions to the moon why the moon has to be studied further and what it offers to the scientific community. Thank you very much.